times, it turns out, with applications to insurance. I work as a product manager at times, so I'm facing the customer and I'm facing the dev team. But I also do machine learning and work on, well, I don't work on this stuff at work because I'm not sure how we would make money doing it. But if you have some ideas for that, let me know. And, uh, I'm Ross, and uh, I do occasional competitions to learn new things. Otherwise, I uh, concur with things and do good things on this. Right, and so uh, we're actually we're actually presenting three competitions today uh, because there's a trio, and it's probably the first time anyone's presented three competitions. So that probably makes us the best presenters ever. <laughs> Oh yeah? Yeah. See yeah, stand in testing? Yeah. You know something about audio that I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I might be able to turn it down. Or not. Or here. Say something more. I am saying something. I am saying more things. Same thing. Same thing. We haven't really done a rundown for this uh, whole presentation, so uh, we might also run short on time towards the end. And uh, yeah, what we're going to talk about, uh, first we're going to introduce adversarial images. We're going to go through uh, a brief summary of the three competitions. Uh, within those competitions, there's two attacks and one defense, so we'll talk about those, and then at the end, beer. And this is going to be a pretty technical presentation, because there's obviously not a lot of business domain here be a lot of kind of uh, teaching you about attacks and how they work. Uh, at times, I know if there's enough people in the room, at least one of you is going to struggle to keep up. And so definitely please, please like join in and ask questions uh, and slow us down when we need to. I'm going to leave early, but that's not because I still don't need the content. She's really smart. All right, so what is an adversarial image? It's an image that's uh, being input to a machine learning system of some variety that's been perturbed or modified to make it predict the wrong class. Um, for this competition, we're specifically talking about convolutional neural networks, but it doesn't really ultimately matter because it can apply to any sort of machine learning system, uh, whether it's deep or not as well. Uh, this is uh, Panda is one uh, example that you'll see in a lot of the, the literature out there. That's probably the first thing that will pop up in Google search. And it's basically showing original panda image at a perturbation that looks like noise, um, but it's not. It's based on the gradient. And then you predict something that's completely the wrong class with a higher percentage accuracy than the original image, which is often the case as well. So I'm just going to run through a couple other uh, examples before we get into some more details. Here's uh, another one that cropped up in some uh, non-Python notebook demo. Much pretty similar to the panda. Although an interesting property of this one is, uh, you'll see if you study the noise, it starts to have a little bit of structure to it, uh, which is very interesting. Um, this is uh, another picture you'll see if you do a little bit of searching on the top. It's basically trying to illustrate with just a very simple two-class system that adversarial um, perturbations basically change the decision boundary for the, the model. Um, if you can imagine uh, a hugely dimensional space such as all images uh, and all the potential adversarial examples, it makes the, the decision space way, way, way more complicated than the normal um, classification problem. We'll come back to this concept later in the, the defense at the, towards the end. So uh, a lot of people might be thinking, well, why does this matter if you classify an image wrong? Might be problematic in some situations, but is it actually going to cause any uh, harm or any damage? Uh, it turns out that these techniques, uh, these attacks can be done on pretty much any machine learning model or any neural network. And reinforcement learning with neural network policies, it's been shown you can very easily attack those as well. Uh, so typical reinforcement learning applications for gaming, for instance, where you're based on images, you're taking control decisions. You can perturb the images in that situation and make the control system do the wrong thing. And you can basically make it do whatever you want it to do. So if we're talking about reinforcement learning in robotics or uh, actual systems, this could be a very, very, very big problem. Uh, similar, yeah? Uh, if you go back one 
Jay, is that Jacobian? Like, what what is that noise right there? Yeah, that's that's the derivative. Okay. So, yeah. It's the derivative. It is the law school. Okay. But it's probably important to know that if you go back to the previous image, the the, the parrot, that it looks the same to a human's eye. Yeah. You added noise to it, but I can't tell that it's not a parrot. But you're able to fool the neural network to say that it's a parrot. Yeah, a lot of the examples do actually look. Um, they're, like the human will think it looks exactly the same. For this competition, though, the uh, the threshold for the cutoff is actually pretty high, so you can see the, the modifications quite easily. But in general, there's, there's even been, since this whole competition ended, a paper came out with like a one pixel attack, which is crazy. Because all of these ones generally modify all the pixels within a certain uh, range. Sorry, just really briefly, we're, we're moving the boundary? We're not, we're not looking for point, uh, points that are on the wrong no, side of the No, showing that like, once you add the perturbation, the boundary essentially, after you've modified things, is completely changed. So we're, we're crossing the boundary. Like if you wanted to predict them correctly, you'd have to change the boundary to be way more complicated. Thanks. And so the scenario that like academic research, <laughs> like, that everyone's sort of worried about, is this idea that some adversary, that's the adversarial, so some adversary out there is going to make some change that like a human supervisor wouldn't notice, uh, and then would cause our neural networks or, or any classifiers or any machine learning, I guess, to sort of do the unexpected. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't seen a lot of like really well articulated like actual real world, world scenarios where that's the case. And I'd point out especially that um, I mean one of the reasons we do artificial intelligence is so that we don't have a human supervisor. So even if it does look different to a human, this is still like a problem. Uh, but especially if a human wouldn't tell the difference, now we're in really mm -hmm. trouble. Well, as, as is what we worked on in this competition, can be used to completely fool most of the cloud-based classification services like Clarify and AWS and all those ones. It will transfer attacks, will uh, screw those up pretty badly. Um, yeah. So if you go back to the classifier, do ma max margin methods uh, in terms of cost functions ever make an entry into this? Is that something to look at? There's a huge, yeah, there's a lot of literature on this. And yeah. I haven't looked at that specifically. Uh, this is another uh, kind of scary example. Uh, these sorts of systems, again, are being put in self-driving cars and robotics. You can basically make everyone disappear. That's going to be a problem. Um, not getting the big picture, so this happened before training, so you have to include some extra pictures in No, it's training. after training, it's at test time, that's the problem. So you train the network, so you train. deployed it, you can then modify the images so that that model will predict the wrong thing. So how do you change the boundaries in your model? We'll, we'll get into that. Okay. There's a, yeah, a lot of stuff. So that, this is the sort of last like, high level why it matters example. Uh, so yeah, the competitions, uh, it was three different Kaggles, all hosted by uh, the same group of people, um, Dean Goodfellow and uh, Alexei Krakin from Google. Um, there was targeted attack, non-targeted non attack, and defense. Um, so for the targeted attack, you're basically trying to make the model predict the class that you want it to. Um, for non-targeted, you're just trying to make it predict a class that it, not predict the class that it was supposed to. And for defense, you're supposed to basically take the modified images and predict the correct class, even though they've been modified to try and make you predict the wrong one. So it's a very interesting, um, I guess, trio of uh, competitions in that it helps a lot to do all three of them because they all feed into each other, especially having a strong attack makes a stronger defense and vice versa. Razzles, I have 15 still. Razzles, hold it, please. That was, well, all the teams, I think most of them were active. I'll show you something in a moment that'll show that. Is, is there a specific uh, classifier? Maybe it's on this slide. A specific classifier that they use for all these companies? It's anything. Any, any image net network. Why well, anything, actually? Well, yeah, anything. As a defense, you are invited to do anything you want in order to correctly classify an image that's being attacked. Yeah. And it, it was using the image net classes, so it was using the same thousand classes that ImageNet 1K uh, involves. Um, but even, even for the attack competitions, you're not attacking a specific model. <coughs> but there's a limited number of models that could be used. Because you also want high accuracy uh, to begin with as your starting point. And there's a 
limited range of those. Um, uh, so the competition, yeah, the Ujet 1K classes, uh, when they're running the competition, you, there's basically four bins of um, epsilons for like where they clamp your uh, perturbations at. Uh, and then they have a data sets for the competition that are outside of the actual ImageNet data sets. They were pulled from other um, sources. I think they all came from Flickr. Yeah. And uh, so we, we all worked with 1,000 public dev images that were used for the first rounds, and we all had access to download those for, um, for developing our models. Uh, the, the ones that were used for private testing for basically leaderboard, we had no access to. It would have been nice to actually know what they were, because especially there are 5,000 that were like used in the final final round. Uh, it behaved a little bit differently than, than we expected, and we don't really know why, but we're guessing that it came from some sort of different set of sources or something. The distribution was a bit different. Yes. Yeah. Um, infinity norms? Yeah, so, so I was going to jump back to that. So without giving a lecture on norms and the different types of them, uh, essentially, you're allowed, so these pixel values are in principle between 0 and 255, or sometimes they normalize them there between 0 and 1. But in any case, if we talk about the 0 to 255 range of pixel values, uh, an infinity norm of 8 as a constraint means that you can take every single value for every single RGB pixel and move it up or down by as much as 8. And so, uh, if you, of course, in just a very quick review, you know, if an image, it, it's a, it's a two-dimensional array, and for every uh, pixel, there's an R, a G, and a B value. Every single one takes a value between 0 and 255. And so, sometimes the constraint was 4, as in you could increase or decrease every R, G, and B value by as much as 4. And then the rather large one uh, is 16. And you, when somebody's modified an image by 16, you can definitely tell that they've done it. Um, <coughs> Oh, but there's maybe a couple more just quick comments. Uh, these images were 299 by 299 images. Uh, there's a lot of ImageNet models out there that expect that, especially the Inception models. And this is all Google land, so they want you to play with their models and their code if possible, uh, thanks to Kaggle and so on. Uh, and, and the other interesting thing here is uh, these, these images were like unusually easy to classify. So like the top one accuracy of like Inception ResNet V2, I think it was like something like 98% on these images. And that's kind of way higher than you would get. Like, uh, you know, state-of-the-art ImageNet performance is more like 80 to 85%. And so again, we're not really privy to how they came up with this, but that, that meant that the defenses were starting from an easier position than they would maybe in the real world. Okay, so this is also not a, none of these competitions were typical in the way that you normally do a Kaggle, where you work on your model on your own machine, you take the inputs, you run it through the model, you get a CSV file and you put it up there. You actually have to submit code that runs on a Docker container, and they run it in their cloud with all their crazy GPUs, and they take weeks to get back with your results, which also kind of made things in mind. But uh, it made the competition pretty fun and exciting. So, um, you basically get a, a JSON file where you define the parameters of your Docker container. You, you put code in the container, and um, or you, you reference a, a place where the code gets a zip file with the code, and the model weights get pulled in, and then it all runs it in a big Python script and runs the attacks against the defenses and collects everything and like mapped drives through the Docker ecosystem. So that was pretty fun. And they, they run your code without you there to do anything about it, yeah. which is very stressful because that means it has to work perfectly. And then even more stressed, there's a time limit on like, how long each of the models has to run, and they just kind of whack it off when uh, you go they over. They disqualify you if you go uh, over. That's yeah, in the first round, we, didn't, we thought they would cut us off, so we were safe to let it run a little longer. Like, OK, we'll get most of the examples up. They just completely disqualified the result because we were over, and then we had to fix that for the next round. Um, in, in the time limit, you had 500 seconds to do what you were going to do with 100 images. So, so that's like roughly uh, how much time we're talking about. Uh, like so, the thousand images were broken up into ten chunks of hundred, and you got five hundred seconds each time. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you have any way of knowing before you run what it's, how fast it's going to run on, that, on their hardware? No, because it's running in the, like the GCP, like the Google Cloud Platform, and those GPUs don't run as fast as most people's mm -hmm. like ten eighties or whatever in the home machines. Uh, the CPUs have like you know more context switching and other things that are slowing mm -hmm. down, so. There's definitely a, a side of, we're trying to guesstimate a performance penalty that we would be running versus running locally. 
and we kind of got it right, but then we had to throw in a little extra code towards the end to like make sure that it was definitely right. And we started doing like a moving average of our like, cycle times to kind of cut it off when we needed to. Because yeah, not only are they slower, but they're unpredictable. Yeah, they also like from run to run. They're like there's a pretty big variance in the run time. So, yeah. But it was like we did. They did tell us like what kind of instance they were using, and so we could go and run our code on those instances to get a sense. We we could discover the unreliability. And I guess just to make sure that, so we're all clear here. So, um, uh, so there are two types of attacks, and people submit code for those attacks. And then all of the attacks are run against all of the images. So if you imagine if you have 100 attacks and 1,000 images, now we have uh, 100,000 attack images that have been generated. And then every defense is run against all of those images. And uh, an attack gets a point every time they are successful. So if it's a targeted attack, I got I got a defense to say the target class, I score a point. Um, a a, a non-target attack gets scores a point every time the defense is wrong. And the defense scores a point every time that they were right, even though the image was attacked. And the goal is to score the most points. Uh, and there were, there were three rounds, so every two weeks. So another thing, like unlike a normal Kaggle competition, you can't just submit over and over and over again as much as you like, because of course they're running your code and they're doing all this complicated stuff that takes forever. And so every two weeks, they ran all the attacks against all the defenses. And the last round, it took them almost two weeks to do that. So you know, only, I think, days before the final deadline, we got the preliminary results of the, yeah, of the third round. That last round was also only a two-week window, so basically yeah, we had a few days to find out what to change from the, the very last results that came back, which was pretty interesting and frustrating. Uh, and it, it ran for two months, which is pretty short, given how complicated all this stuff is. And also, if you familiar with submission anxiety on the normal Kaggles is even more so because like you're down to the minute and it's like several gigabyte upload and like, you're running a simulation in your machine and you're like, okay, I think this one's better than the last one. You're waiting for it, it's like, come on, come on, come on, come on, and then it's like, bam, hit the button and take over. It's like, oh, that happened on our final submission for our defense, but whatever. It's still did okay. Um, yeah, and then it turns out when everybody's trying to upload gigabyte files to Kaggle at the same time, the uploads start getting really, really, really slow. Actually, the Kaggle website is really unreliable. I've really noticed that. I don't know what's going on. What information could you get back from the route? Right. Uh, no. Uh, so they published kind of more than we expected them to. And then you basically got a performance matrix uh, of all attacks against all defenses. And so that was a very informative and turned out um, because you got insights as to what the unknown black boxes were shaped. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Did they use different sets of images each time? Not until the end. So the Probably not. I mean, we don't really know. Yeah, well, well, based <laughs> on what they told us and what I think we saw, all the first dev rounds were using the same dev, or not our dev image set, but another image set, and then they changed it and made it 5,000 images uh, at the end, which is why it took a month for our final, final results to come back, because they um, made a huge increase in the images for but I guess the thing I'm actually asking is, do you get to see the images that you messed up on? Um, no. Did you or did anybody else like add a signature to their attacks that their defense could recognize? Uh, I think they were, they, uh, someone asked that question very early in the forums and it got shut down pretty quick. Okay. <laughs> um, so Cleverhands is a, uh, a Google repository they put on the TensorFlow uh, GitHub. Uh, it included a whole set of demo code, which basically does the, the Docker execution framework for this competition, at least for the, the competitors, for us to use. And it also includes reference examples in TensorFlow of a lot of the uh, attacks. Uh, not so much defenses, most of the defenses are just like, here's the model, we run it, and it's mostly an attack-based repository, at least at this point. I think after this, they might be adding some new defense based on some of the uh, results, but I don't know. And it's, it's a good resource if you're interested in this at all. I definitely. So this is newer. Yeah, so, so uh, I did this partly for myself, uh, and then I threw it in the presentation. So uh, you're complaining about my axes, so, so it says in the title, yeah. So this is normalized score, so this on the y-axis here, this is essentially what percentage of the time were you successful? Uh, so 35% here. Uh, and then I, this is ranked across the bottom. So uh, you know, first place is up here, and, and 40th place is here, and then a bunch of people didn't get any points at all because this is hard. 
Uh, and you can see I have a different line for each round. So, so it's interesting, so this is for targeted attack. As the rounds went by, everybody kind of did better. This line is moving out, which is very nice. Uh, and so if you look at the final round here, there were like kind of 60 odd competitors. There were only 40 who ever really actually like had any success at all. And we were fifth, which was our best result out of the competitions here at, uh, at 0.35. And you know, like a, a step below uh, the most successful. Uh, and then for non-targeted, uh, we have you know more like 80 some uh, participants. Uh, slightly different shape here actually. Uh, this plateau actually moves down. Uh, as we go, that's perhaps because the defenses got better as the competition progressed. Uh, and so there we are in ninth place up here, uh, down on the curve uh, from the group. And then if we look at the defenses, <coughs> we can see actually defenses got like substantially better as the competition moved along. Uh, and so there we are in ninth again. Uh, and so uh, we had. So we talked about Clever Huns a moment ago, and in Clever Huns there, there was essentially a sample submission. And you could basically zip that up and submit it, and, and then you're in the competition. And what was very significant is that sample submission, well, the really easy one, was the Inception V3 network. And so this, that's this plateau here. So all of the, these are you know, 15, 20 odd participants, and the number increases as the competition goes along who have just taken the sample, zipped it up, and submitted it. And so when you know that a quarter of all defenses, you know exactly what they're doing, mm -hmm. then you know, that might change the way that you play the game. Uh, and if you wanted to win, that can be definitely a better change than you play the game. Uh, I don't think you played that game quite enough. Though. Maybe not, I don't know. Hmm. So you guys so, could have bent it and just focused on that quarter. Yeah. And then just focused on, on trying to, to, to break that bubble yeah. where everything you submitted would just eat that. We and definitely paid attention to it, and you could totally completely rewrite those models, but then you would lose some ability to do well against the better, more interesting yeah. models. And it's like you're overfitting on it, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, could you go back one, please? So, I'm seeing that in round zero there were 40 participants, and then round three there were 100. So people actually joined after the... So, so this was like a two-month competition. This was at two weeks, this was at four weeks, this was at six weeks, and this was at the end. So you could join at any time. So there were some late joiners, yeah. Some people just like yeah, put a submission into the final round. And actually some good ones, too. Yeah, some good ones, yeah. <laughs> the leaderboard changed quite a bit with, I guess, some, some people that were actually doing research in this area, I think, uh, in, in various universities put a submission in towards the end and a pretty strong results. Oh. Okay. Uh, do you have any clue why uh, there's uh, like a plateau in the middle for the all tracks? Uh, oh, um, yeah, so actually there were sample submissions for all of them. Yeah, there were sample so. attacks as well. So all of the plateaus are basically people using the samples are barely changing them, uh, and they weren't very strong compared to the work that people did. So these are people who did something interesting but didn't meet the sample <laughs> <laughs> but the plateaus are at different levels. It's because it's targeted. Because people versus oh, defense right. and they you. both change. Yep. Thank you. So, tax. Yeah, sure. Okay, so there's a few things to cover just about, like, just basic concepts about attacks. So, we talk about white box attacks and black box attacks. In a white, white box attacks, I have access to your model, your architecture, all of your weights, maybe even your code. I know everything that you're going to do. And I'm going to use that to try and figure out how to fool you. And maybe it's not so surprising that that's possible. Because I mean, in any sort of competitive situation, if I knew exactly what you're going to do, that would be a big advantage to me. In a black box attack, in principle, I know nothing. Right? I don't know anything about what you're doing. Uh, and I want to somehow fool you. And what's interesting is that a typical black box attack is that I do a white box attack on a model that I do have access to. And I hope that somehow that will also fool your model. And it seems kind of crude, but it's surprisingly effective. Uh, and that's actually what we call transfer. So essentially this idea of, uh, of fooling, fooling one network with something that you've crafted to fool another. Uh, and an interesting observation about transfers are that non-targeted attacks transfer more easily than targeted, uh, which, which you might imagine because fooling you to output one specific class is kind of I mean, that sounds pretty hard, but fooling you would just be wrong. I mean, it's just, it's a less restrictive 
uh, goal, right? And so uh, that's my intuition as to why they turn to the better. Uh, have you, did you add that point? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, we kind of already covered it okay. a little bit. But yeah, analyzing how the attacks transfer was a big part of this competition and figuring out like what to do and how to get a better score. Uh, because people were using different models and we wanted to try and um, maximize, especially for the targeted, since the transfer is reduced, you want to try and maximize that transfer by doing things to your attacks to make it apply to as many different defense models as possible. A really important uh, realization uh, when thinking about the meta game in this competition was the goal is not to defeat the strongest defense, which is kind of what you might normally think of in terms of competition. The goal is to defeat as many defenses as possible. And so, in particular, the sheep that were all submitting the sample submission. You needed to make sure that you, you gathered as many of them as you could, uh, but you needed to pay attention to transfer because you wanted to at least score some points against the other, uh, other players. So yeah, this, this uh, um, I agree with, but basically covers what was just said and the fact that everyone started off with Inception V3 as examples, so a lot of people uh, based their initial submissions and sometimes their only submissions on that. Um, and then Inception ResNet V2, which is a much better, more powerful network, more capacity, and more accuracy out of the box. Uh, it's very similar to Inception V3 in terms of how it plugs in and made our TensorFlow an example. So a lot of people adopted that uh, network as their like kind of next iteration. And then partway through the competition, Google actually released two sets of pre-trained weights for an adversarially trained Inception V3 and also uh, an adversarial trained Inception ResNet V2. Basically, we'll get into the, that training technique later, but it, it's a way of making the model more robust for adversarial attacks by training them on adversarial examples. And so these weights were actually, especially for the, the Inception ResNet V2, quite challenging to uh, defeat, like really stepped up the, um, the need to come up with a better attack. And so people throughout the competition started adopting these roughly, I guess, in a similar time schedule, and this affected how you had to adjust the knobs on your attacks to maximize the transfer in a way that kept your score reasonable. Okay. And I'm going to do some other. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so I tried to do some like meta game analysis <laughs> like during the round. So this is probably round zero here. Yeah, this is and round so, zero. Um, around one. No. Okay. Early on. I, maybe without. Yeah, I can't. Uh, maybe without like saying how I did it. I mean, I basically did some T-SNE clustering on the defenses. So I used uh, how effective attacks were against them as a feature vector, and then uh, I did some clustering. And so, uh, like, in the, so maybe this is a great just single example here. In the top left corner, uh, we've got I've labeled the five best performers. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's TSNE is if they're like they're abstract at this point. Okay. It's just some sort of notion that things that are near each other are similar and far is, okay. is unsimilar. That's about it. Um, and so, so yeah, the top performers are up there on the bottom left, so they're all together. Uh, and we can see they're right next to this uh, these two models that Ross was just talking about that they made available. And then there's this cluster of terrible performers down here, all around that Inception V3. And so this is a way, and, and, and people who've done something maybe slightly smart with the Inception D3 who are right in here, and so those are all great candidates. Uh, and then three, this, this is like some change in later rounds. This is, I skipped two, this was three, and then there's four in the next one. Yeah. So um, you can see the, the this gets more polarized, which is quite interesting. Now we've got some really great performing defenses and all the Inception D3s, especially as, um, as the attackers learn to, to kill the sheep, uh, it changes things. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I have anything too insightful. Yeah, no, it's first. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, now I'd like to teach you a little bit about how you do attacks. Uh, and so uh, I hope you guys can all follow along. This is pretty important, so please stop and ask questions. The, so the prerequisite to understand this a little bit is to understand the basic idea of neural networks and how we train them. I'm going to cover that a little bit right here. And so this is just a quick review of how we, how we normally train a neural network, okay? So we start with an image, or perhaps a batch of images, but let's just talk about one image. And we input that into our neural network. This is just a function. It's a hyperparametric function approximator. Uh, but in any case, uh, and that's a function of the x that you just put in and its weights, which I've, 
I've given the theta here. And that function outputs class probabilities. So basically, in this case, there are a thousand classes and it gives every single class a probability between zero and one and they sum to one. Uh, and uh, we calculate a loss on that. So basically, if, it, you know, if it's supposed to output a certain class and it didn't, then you know, it has a higher loss. If it got it right, it has a lower loss. We use the term loss because it's essentially the objective that we're optimizing for and we want to minimize our loss. Uh, and so the way that we do this is once we've calculated our loss, we actually go, we do the back propagation. So this is the backward pass where we start calculating derivatives. So we calculate a derivative of the loss with respect to the, the probabilities, and then we take another step back and we calculate the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights in the network. And this basically gives us exactly what we're looking for. Right? This tells us if I move the weights in this direction, then my <coughs> loss will get better. And that's exactly what I wanted to know because I want to move these so that my loss will get better. Now, I don't, I don't just act on that directly. I actually pass that into some optimizer, which usually does some simple but clever math so that we end up with an update. And that update is based on this, but maybe it's slightly different, and we change the weights. Then, of course, we do this all over again. We grab the image, we put it in, and we go around the loop, and we do that like until we get bored, and hopefully uh, it fits. And so with that out of the way, I have now a very similar diagram where I'm hoping to explain to you the, basically the basic fast gradient sign method attack. So to run through it again, I have an image. It goes into the neural network. This is a function of the image and its weights. Uh, I get class probabilities, and I get a loss. But if we think about a targeted attack now, uh, when we were training our neural network, we wanted it to, to output the correct class. But now, actually, we want it to output something else. So we're going to calculate our loss slightly differently. Uh, we, basically, the target is no longer the correct class, it's something else, but the map is all the same. So we have a loss. We calculate a derivative here against the probabilities. We can calculate the derivative here against the weights. And if we were training, normally we would stop here and we would do an update. But because we're being clever, uh, we go one step further. So we're actually able to calculate a derivative of the loss with respect to the pixels in the image. So now, this tells us exactly what we're looking for. If I change the pixels in the image, this would change whether or not I'm outputting that thing I'm targeting. And so that's great. Uh, and then, so how will we act on this in the fast gradient sign method? So this is going to be like some vector uh, pointed in some direction of some magnitude, who knows. If we take the sign of that, all of the little values in here are like plus 0.1 and minus 0.2. They just become plus 1 and minus 1. So they just become a direction. Okay? Uh, but we still, we still now have a direction to go in that will help us get where we want to get to. Uh, and so in the case of this competition, it lines up very nicely. If you remember, we have this infinity norm constraint. We're allowed to change everything by, you know, for example, plus or minus 8 pixel values. And so we can just take 8 and multiply it by all of these 1s and negative 1s. And now we have a delta that we can add to the image. It's all eights and minus eights. And so we take one big step, we add it to the image, and that's our adversarial attack. But in terms of that eight magnitude, is that always going to be better than, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, six? Not necessarily. Right. This is just basically the simplest thing you could do. Sure. And so in your implementation, did you do a random number between one and n, or did you just go with n? My implementation is going to be complicated, and hopefully we have okay. time to Great. Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, your attack image, it depends on the input? Yeah. Yeah, so you put it in input and you use that to compute the gradients and uh, it's customized, therefore, for every... For example, yeah. like one, one, attack, um, one additive uh, attack that you're going to have to yeah. do whatever. This is showing the generation of an adversarial example from a given image. So, tailored to that image, what perturbation you add to it to make it predict the class that you want it to, basically. The bottom step of that. And so there are iterative... Ver so there are iterative versions of this. So here, uh, actually go back because I'll use this a little bit more. Um, so, so here we took the sign and we took one sort of step of size eight, right? One big step, we satisfy our constraint, so it's still good and it's probably effective because we made a huge change. Uh, but we could instead have taken two steps of size four, right? And that would have still done a difference of eight, but maybe we would have got to a smarter place, right? Because we didn't just we calculate, so what you do is you calculate the derivative twice. So we go through, we come here, we take a step of four. We now have this slightly attacked image. We put that in, we come all the way around, and we take another step. Uh, and so then that would take me to this next slide where it's I try it's, to. It's, the multi-step that's interesting is actually gives you better attack on your targeted model, but the single step is a little more like a blunt hammer, like a sledgehammer that you can just smash more models with because the transfer is much better than the multi-step. 
And so, so here's um, my sort of abstract attempt here. So uh, this is like a kind of a two-dimensional space. Suppose I just have like just two pixels, okay? So this is its value right now, and this box is the constraint it lives in, right? So I can move it up or down like this, and I can move it up or down like this. And when I do the fast gradient side, I pick a direction and I just go boom, right out to the corner, right? And so I'm living in the space of like maximum possible change. I wasn't even allowed to go anywhere out here. And that's my intuition as to why these transfer better, is because you really kind of max it out. Uh, but maybe I could have done something more. You always hit the wall with the, with the iterative team. Yeah, 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 usually. Although presumably for some pixel you don't because there's so many of them. But, uh, so here you might take n smaller steps. I just talked about two. If we supposed it was three, then I would start here, I'd get a direction. It's the same direction because it's this, like in the same image in this sense. And I take one step, and then I calculate a derivative again. And then maybe here and now the derivative here is slightly different. And so instead of going out to the corner, I've ended up here. So it's maybe somewhere smarter. Uh, and in practice, uh, I'd be more successful against the target network, but perhaps less successful against the black box and stuff like this. Um, we can take that a step further. We don't have to sort of divide our steps up perfectly so that they add up to the constraint. Uh, so in sort of my diagram here, uh, we're taking kind of fairly big steps. And so, I mean, these two arrows are supposed to be the same length, but I guess they're not. I should have been able to use a computer to do that. But <laughs> suppose that they were. Um, uh, I'd like take a step here and then take a step here. I'm on the boundary now. If I calculate the derivative in a direction, maybe I wanted to go here, uh, but I'm not allowed to go there. That's outside of the constraint. And so you can basically clip it or like project it, if you imagine I have a little dotted line, which I could have also done with the computer, uh, right here. So maybe I, I, I end up at this spot. Uh, to affect you with the box constraint optimization. Uh, yeah, although I assume that people do smarter things than this when they're actually doing it. But you would know that anyway. Okay. <laughs> but so, so that, these are the sort of the basic iterative versions of what I'm just talking about. Uh, and let's have a look at the pretty pictures. All right. Uh, that's a big deal to this group. So um, this, is, this is one of the 1,000. I got to know these pretty well. Looks fake. <laughs> yeah, you can tell. Right? I mean, this is a 16. Right, so you can tell that like this is not right. Yeah. Um, uh, and just for the record, I use the Inception V3 out of Torch Vision. These things matter if you really care. Um, uh, and we so this gorilla a lot. It was like one of the first images when we distorted randomly, so we saw a lot of this. Yeah, I wake things. up in the morning and run to the computer and look to see what the gorilla looks like. Uh, so yeah, like the natural image, uh, the FGSM, so just a single step, and then I ran like 20 iterations with some step size, whatever. Um, maybe on the next one. Uh, maybe you can tell there's like a little bit more, uh, this is kind of blotchier normally, and this one is a little bit finer because like this is just one big step to the, cons like, but where these are like, there's a little bit of chance for more. Uh, we spend a lot of time staring at noisy light into the night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Passing images back and forth across what uh, was the last for some of these? Oh, we didn't keep, yeah, so it really didn't matter really. I mean, I guess in some cases it would with some of the more trippy images, but for these um, FGSM ones, it's pretty blotchy and there's not much uh, pattern to it. Right. You wouldn't be able to tell, yeah. Okay, so now I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking about this. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna do the full detail of this slide, uh, but I'll just talk about it um, like at a high level. So uh, at the time that the competition started, the Carlini-Wagner, Carlini-Wagner, who knows, uh, L2 attack was considered pretty state-of-the-art. And what was amazing about it is that it can find very, very small changes to fool and everybody gets very excited about that. And so they essentially do this optimization where uh, they're minimizing the L2 norm, that's like essentially the, the, the magnitude of the change that they made, uh, and combined with how much they fooled the network. And they have a few magic hyperparameters, they do a bunch of searching, and they eventually find a very, very small change. But yeah, the problem was they were really, they were optimizing to find a very small change, which doesn't work well for this computation because you want to find the biggest change that will uh, give them more points. There are no points for subtlety in this competition, yeah. right? So, so after you, you learned the, the sign attack, the next attack that you guys learned was uh, CWL2? Yeah. And then from there, are you like researching lots of papers, or is it all spent time you know, uh, implementing uh, CWL2? Uh, CWL2 took me like a day, to, day or two to port from the principal example to PyTorch for the reason PyTorch. It was, yeah, it wasn't that hard. We simplified it a little bit. And then uh, the attack that was our, I guess, best attack um, was modified by Lexi. Uh, 
uh, kind of inspired by this, but with uh, some further constraints for the, the competition at hand. We got, we got to move on, like, we'll, we'll, or, yeah, is, ask is, that there, is, is there a dumb answer, or? Uh, no, so what's the W and what's the X? So there, uh, the, the delta oh, is what oh, you Oh, W will add. come up in, in his attack, so. Okay. We'll if I have time, I'll get it. And, and the delta is what you add to the event at the end? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so, okay, we'll talk, <coughs> very tempting to only present what we did, but somebody else won. So, uh, <laughs> Winning targeted attack. So this is a bunch of guys, and I looked them up. They're from Tsinghua University. They have a GitHub link, so you can look at their code. They have a paper that they've written about it. Uh, and it's amazingly simple what they did. Uh, and they've called it momentum iterative fast gradient sign method. And so basically, this is very similar to what I was just talking about. Uh, they, they keep track of a, a gradient, but in terms of uh, with momentum. So every time they do a loop of their iteration, uh, they take uh, some constant, typically one, but anyway, some constant times the old gradient that they've been keeping track of. And then this is the derivative divided by the L1 norm of the derivative. So basically, uh, take the absolute value of every entry and sum it, I think that's right. But in any case, just this norm value. And so what this means is they're not just acting on the current gradient all the time, their gradient has some recent memory to it, uh, and which is a very common technique in optimization. And so when they're taking their steps, they just take a step that's based on the sign of that uh, momentum carrying gradient. Do they blur their gradients too? I don't, I didn't see it, but they might have. I, I'm sure that's something we, we were kicking ourselves because some people got a boost by, we blurred our images on, um, for going into the attack um, cycle, but we didn't blur our gradients, and some people got good results by blurring their gradients, yeah. made a chance for them. Uh, and, and they had slightly different, I just go back one second, they had like, uh, when, when the epsilon was small, they did lots of iterations against, uh, uh, they were, so everybody attacks an ensemble of images. Remember I talked about how I attack the network I do have and hope that it will fool the other networks. That was what everyone was doing, and to make their attacks really good, they attacked like an ensemble of networks, you know, take it to the nth degree like Kaggle does. Uh, and so they attacked this ensemble, by the way, those are the sheep, right? So that's why they were doing that. Uh, and then when they had slightly more room to work with, Epsilon 8, they actually attacked this big ensemble, uh, and uh, they used fewer steps, because of course it takes more time, it was a time limit. Uh, yeah, so those are, the, those are the basic points I wanted to make there. Uh, I have the next slide was about the second place competitor. Uh, you don't actually really need to read this, but I thought it was very interesting. So Sang Chia here, uh, he attacked, uh, there's the sheep, right? And actually these are the other uh, sample models, so he knows what matters, that's good. Uh, and this, so this is a row by row plan that he cooked up. So his basic method is uh, when you take a step, add a little bit of noise, and then also uh, take a step size, uh, like, like I just talked about with the, the, iter the iterative fast gradient sign method. And so this plan says, step one, load these four networks into memory. I don't know why he loads this one, because he didn't ever use it. Uh, and then in the next step, I'm gonna attack all three of the inception networks with this step size and this noise and then three, and then three, and then only this one, and then these three, and these two, and this one, and then just these two for a while, and then we're gonna go down to half the step size, and then this one alone twice. And it's, it's amazing. I mean, it came second, so it's good, obviously, but it's completely handcrafted, uh, and really baffling, I have to say. Uh, I did experiment with um, randomly selecting a subset of the ensemble each time rather than attacking whole one. I wasn't successful. Uh, this is not random, I guess. Uh, but anyways, it's very, and, and um, interesting comment, uh, he actually had to turn the noise off for the targeted attack, because it was screwing up his ability to kill the sheep, which is something we found as well, uh, but he used it in the non-targeting for, for effect. Okay, now, uh, time is short, and I want to decide how much I'm going to do about this. Uh, okay, well, I mean, it'd be worth teaching everyone a little bit about changing variables when you're doing optimization. So. Uh, uh, we are essentially trying to maximize how fooled the network is. I mean, that's really what we're optimizing for. We want to fool our target network as much as possible. Um, and we have two constraints. In principle, uh, one is the valid image constraint. So this is my image and this is my change. And I'm not allowed to make it so that image is no longer valid. So if the pixel is already pure white, it's a 255 pixel, I can't push it beyond that. So there's one constraint. And then the other one is, of course, that I'm not allowed, like I have this infinity norm constraint. I can't move, make a delta that's greater than minus epsilon or greater than epsilon. 
And it turns out, like, if you do the math, you can actually rewrite these as a single constraint. Uh, and I do a change of variable. If you're inclined to read the math, do, but otherwise look at my pretty picture. So this is hypertension. And uh, if you look at neural network activations, you, you know this one. Uh, and in principle, uh, 10, 10 h of x, x goes from minus infinity to infinity, but 10 h of x only goes from negative 1 to 1. So this goes all the way out like this, and this goes all the way out like that. And so uh, if we take this, and on this side, we multiply it by the, so spare with me, but we'll break this down, the negative minimum of a pixel value and epsilon. So what is this? So uh, if my pixel value is uh, 4, so it's, it's a very dark pixel because it only has a value of 4 that's low in the 0, 2, 5, 5 range, right? And my epsilon is 8. The minimum of 4 and 8 is 4. And so this is, we're going to multiply this here so this goes down to 4. And then up here, uh, this is assuming we have images on 0 to 1 rather than 2, 5, 5. So let's suppose we're still working with 4, right? So uh, 2, 5, 5 minus 4 is 2, 5, 1. And this is 8. So what is the minimum of 2, 5, 1 and 8? It's 8, right? And so now what I'm able to do is I'm able to map negative infinity, infinity to from 4 to, uh, from minus 4 to plus 8. And so what I can do now is I've, I've made this change of variable that means uh, my w, which is what I talked about, although I actually don't have it on the slide, my new variable is completely unconstrained. I can, I can set it to any value I want. But because of the math, I know I'm going to satisfy my constraints. And I like to do that uh, so that I can use uh, other optimizers, fancy optimizers. Optimizers we use to do crazy shit, like train neural networks. Uh, optimizers we really like, like Adam. And so uh, here is a diagram that looks kind of familiar from before uh, that is our attack. So we do this change of variable, and we have two inputs now. This is my change of variable. For every single pixel in the image, I knew, now have a number that's from negative infinity to infinity. I do that fancy math, and that gives me it's a, this function uh, that essentially I get an image, and I have my values, and now I have an attacked image. And I put that through some augmentations, random crops and blurs and things like that. I resize it so that it's the correct size for my ensemble, because not everybody is 299, some networks are like 224 and things like that. It goes into each of the networks. Uh, it comes out. Uh, we happen to take the log probabilities for the classes on the way out, and we did a weighted mean, and you got to watch your uh, mathematical stability when you do that. Thank you, Ross. Uh, and then you, you calculate a loss. Again, we have this target. We want it to say something specific. And we do derivatives all the way back through resize, through augmentation, back to this weight, this matrix that I changed. I now get to use Adam because there are no constraints. So I give that to Adam, and it gives me an update and then I make a change and I loop again. Uh, and if you know something about these, you might raise your eyebrows at these two terms right here, uh, because normally we do resizes and augmentations with uh, other packages. We don't do it in the computational graph. So normally you can't calculate derivatives across this, but if you do the work and you implement them, you actually do these in the computational graph, and then you can calculate derivatives all the way back, uh, and you end up with uh, much better attacks, uh, although you might sometimes have to turn them off. Uh, and so, uh, I think I have one more slide where I talk something about this. No, I show, okay, pretty pictures. So, now these are not exactly apples to apples because the iterations are different, but you saw this earlier. This is the 20 iterations. Uh, this is our attack, uh, 50 iterations against Inception v3, and this is our attack, 100 iterations against an ensemble of uh, the adversarially trained Inception v3, Resident 18, and squeeze it doesn't matter. Uh, Interesting structure. I love this image because it's got like clouds. Clouds and sky lead to structure. That's maybe why people think, see things in clouds. Uh, and then I have more. The, the, the interesting thing of the optimizer based attacks like the Carly Wagner and uh, ours, they definitely pick up more on structure in the image and you start seeing some really weird uh, things happening in some of the pictures. The gorilla ass was a little disappointing in this <laughs> one in the end, but I included it anyway. This one is cool. The shoes are cool, like this is cool. Uh, and then I threw in some more. When, when I found out Charles wasn't going to be here, I added more pretty pictures. Uh, <laughs> so, like, hair on animals is great. I don't know how well you see the swirls. Uh, oh, you can't see the eye that formed on this guy's shorts. Uh, and this balloon is kind of replicating itself. That's pretty cool. And There's an eye right here. Yeah, yeah, it There's looks like eyes. Eyes. Yeah, the, the internet classes are full of animals. Um, so, there's um, eyes all this over. Isn't, this one is not showing up, unfortunately. This one's super creepy. There's like a 
a big eye that popped up right there. And the tiger, and pat well, and leopard patches are appearing in the same. He was staring at this late one night. And he just <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, and uh, okay, quickly about the non-target attack because this is easy. Hey, these guys again. They won the non-targeted as well, uh, and they used the momentum and they had a giant stupid ensemble of eight different models, some of which they trained themselves, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and then these guys did something actually quite interesting, but it's not very well documented yet. Uh, these, obviously, Japanese guys, they have a GitHub, but of course it's hard to figure out what people do. When you look at that, this is the paper they based it on. Basically, it's a neural net. I think it has a somewhat kind of UNet style architecture. They basically trained it to fool, like they trained it to output perturbed images. And uh, what's very interesting is this is Jigsaw Puzzle, and we'll see Jigsaw Puzzle again in a moment. So this is the Attack, attack image and the delta that they created. Um, what was cool about this, it ran really fast. Like everyone was taking the time limit, because why wouldn't you? But of course they don't have iterations, so they don't do more just for the sake of it. And it ran in like one sixth the time of attacks like ours. Um, and they used something called Chainer. I haven't heard of that, but anyway, there it is. There you go. They probably got it for free. <laughs> no, it is free. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, so, we had a non-targeted attack that we did. And so basically, earlier, we were making one attack for one image, right? We put that image in, and we looped for a bunch of times, taking steps, calculating derivatives. Well, in principle, we could do that differently. Uh, we, could, we could have one perturbation that we're going to train, and we're going to put random batches of images in. But we're going uh, to keep updating the attack. Uh, but it, so in principle, we're drawing from a distribution of images, and we're hopefully creating one attack that always works against all of them. And so uh, we did that. I attacked some stupidly big ensemble because that's the way we do it. So big that on my graphics card, it only fits with a batch size of four. But that's okay because it works. Uh, and then we create some pretty pictures. Uh, so jigsaw puzzles. Hey, so I'm a clever sausage, and I was thinking, uh, what would be a good attack? Uh, and of course, an image of anything becomes a jigsaw puzzle as long as it's got lines on it. And so I could probably take any picture and turn it into a jigsaw puzzle. And so this is what I was able to train. Uh, this has been kind of amplified. But as you can imagine, the black is like subtracting and the white is adding. And so here it is in action. This is an alp, or maybe it's a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and this is what you get when you add them. This is some castle-y thing. No, definitely a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and I did a bunch of these. So these got super cool. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so uh, real world attack. This is a chameleon, so I thought it might be a good idea. Um, this is African J attacks the brain coral. Uh, TVs seem like a good idea because anything can be on a TV as long as it's got a box around it. Uh, honeycomb, not that great. Prayer rug, I don't know. We, that was in a paper, but it didn't turn out interesting. Spider webs hang in front of things, and so if it looks like a spider web, it might still be an attack. Um, you didn't get any of the monitors with the Chinese uh, characters. No, I'm saving that for another time. Yeah. Uh, actually, it turns out Chinese shows up in lots of things. Uh, anyways. Um, uh, and, and what I did with this is uh, we basically tried every single one against uh, our, our ensemble, and we picked the best one. So that's why we could use many of these at once. Uh, and if it seemed like that wasn't working, then we did a basic iterative attack. You didn't try eyeballs? I, I did do a little bit of trying to like create these by hand, <laughs> and, and I'm like not clever enough. Uh, I did a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think this is covered now. Yeah, that's covered. Uh, and, and so uh, you can create these for anything, so I did. Uh, and if you go to that link, I created one of these for every single class in ImageNet, and they're super fun to look at. These are the creepy ones. So we have scorpion and tarantula and uh, spiny lobster, and you name it, it's in there, page after page, hmm. uh, a thousand of them. Take a look. Right, defenses, we're running low on time, so I'll uh, So defense is hard, um, as you may have gathered from the attacks. It's it's easy to modify the gradients, and if you've got your transfer going, it's pretty easy to attack the multi networks. Uh, some of the common methods uh, some people just try straight up uh, computer vision, so blur, smooth, uh, denoise, basically try and get rid of the sharp features and come in and just hoping it will like, potentially smooth out the perturbations. That's easy to defeat. Um, Although we did it and it looked great in the first game. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, a lot of the, the the interesting thing about this whole thing, if you look at the research out there and the timeline of uh, the attacks and defenses, someone will come up with a great attack, uh, someone will come up with a defense for that, and it's like an arms race. <coughs> as soon as you've published what you had success and what transferred and what attacked what, someone else will like step up the game, and then uh, once you have access to the better defense model, you can attack it again. 
so it's questionable whether any of the results that came out of this competition, even the better defenses, will hold once you have access to those defenses and know what they did and <coughs> tailor attacks sort of in that direction and like add it to this, this sort of ensemble of models that you're attacking uh, and trying to transfer to. Um, another defense technique is distillation. You may have seen distillation where you're trying to train a small model on the outputs of a bigger model to accelerate training and end up with a smaller product. That is actually done with models of the same capacity um, for making them uh, more, uh, more robust to adversarial, adversarial attacks by hoping that it will smooth out the gradients at the boundaries of the classes. Again, it worked for a bit, and then someone came up with stronger attacks, and it no longer works. Um, detect and evade, there's some papers where people try to detect uh, whether the images coming into the model are like out of the typical distribution, and basically shut you down and like default to some like not going to give you something or take some other course of action based on detecting that. It worked for a while. Other papers have come out since that show that like okay we have an attack that this thing can't the, these players cannot detect. Um, the last two actually do have some promise. One of the teams will show you in a bit use something somewhat like a reformer network. It's questionable whether they were actually doing what they thought or whether this will be robust to further attacks uh, from this point. And then adversarial and ensemble adversarial training is probably shown the most promise for a more robust network. Um, initially, we started off with a bunch, a mix of traditional uh, computer vision techniques and basically an ensemble of some big deep networks. Uh, we used the, the two adversarial training ones that Google provided the weights. Uh, threw in some DPN uh, networks uh, because we figured not many people would be using them, so it might give us a leg up. Also, interestingly, both those DPN networks were trained on 5K ImageNet and then uh, fine-tuned on a 1K, so we thought the distribution of the, the, the training samples might improve things a little bit. Uh, then we did a lot of crops, scales, flips, blurs, uh, feeding into eight uh, different cycles through each of those models. Uh, we did a log soft max average of the different crops, and then we used the mean reciprocal ranking across the models with the hopes that like, if one model was completely out of whack, that would be a better thing than just straight up averaging them and give you a little bit more uh, leeway in terms of uh, the other models that are reasonably high rank on the, uh, the resolve. So. Yeah, if, you, if you just take an average, then a very full model brings the whole yeah. ensemble down. Or like presumably, your your uh, Original class is still going to be pretty high in the ranking, um, but the targeted attack would take 99% and leave you with very little. But if you do it by ranking, then it will have a lower impact on your uh, ensemble. So the winning defense again, same team, they did really well. Um, they added what they call a denoiser into the network architecture. So they again, like most of the top teams, they used ensemble. And each of the models in their ensemble, they modify them within the actual network hierarchy to have a stack of denoising layers that more or less mirrored the layers inside the network. So say for a ResNet where you have like, the different chunks of blocks, within each of those blocks, they had a, a parallel stack of denoising layers that they would stick in there and then sum with the original layers at the very end of each sort of block region with the hopes that the perturbations and the like adversarialness along the way would be returned back to like the normal manifold or like the, the normal distribution of images if they locked one. I think we can't see exactly how they trained it. We're guessing that they probably locked the original pre-trained weights and only trained their denoiser with uh, an adversarial examples and normal examples. And that's how they like basically trained those extra denoiser layers to bring the samples back to something throughout the whole model that would make the end result being what it should have been. Uh, I question whether that actually is a denoiser or whether it's just adding more capacity to the model because we'll see um, uh, fairly recent papers basically proposing that the whole um, reason why adversarial training works so well, especially for big models, is that you can learn the very crazy um, Just lost my train of thought here. Decision yeah, the decision boundary uh, with more capacity in the model. And for ImageNet, that's really challenging because these models are really pushing the limits already of what you can do realistically in the GPU. Uh, for uh, MNIST, 
these uh, techniques actually work really well and you can make a really, really robust MS model because if you multiply the capacity of an MS model by many times, it's still a really small model and it's quite hard to attack. Uh, ImageNet, you can't 10 times most ImageNet models and hope to ever be able to train. So adversarial framing, uh, most successful, uh, one of the more successful techniques for defense. Uh, you basically train uh, the neural network with a combination of normal images and a combination of adversarial images. The first uh, iterations of this basically would train uh, a neural network with perturbed images from itself as it ran. So it was only training on normal images and uh, adversarial images on its own rates as it progressed in time. Uh, that worked, but it had some, uh, some, still had some vulnerabilities. An improvement to this was to do ensemble adversarial training, where you <coughs> use an ensemble or you rotate through different pre-trained networks of different architectures, and you train with those as examples. So you basically cycle through, you run an image through uh, ImageNet, compute the gradients with whatever attack you're doing, uh, train your model, throw that into the, the training batch, do one for inception, do one for inception resident v2, and then do one with your own, uh, and do some normal images in that batch. So you have a batch that's a distribution of different adversarial uh, images from different networks, and some normal ones, and some from your own network. And that ends up uh, resulting in a pretty robust uh, out-of-the-box network that is more... Uh, so when you have this robust network, uh, does it affect the accuracy on non-perturbed images? Like a little bit, yes. Okay. You're using some of the capacity of the model uh, to learn adversarial images, and then that's decreasing some of the capability, but not by much. It's still a pretty, especially with the inception of SNFV2 that Google trained, it's only losing like a point or two of top one uh, accuracy, and the top five is still pretty darn good. Um, it's pretty expensive training. It is very expensive training, as we found out too late in the competition. So we attempted to do this, but uh, I think we'll call it an ensemble ensemble adversarial training. Uh, so with our crazy um, resizing augmentation built into the stack of networks and multiple networks, we put that in a front end, basically called an adversarial generator, and we would cycle through all of the different attacks, including the basic ones, and then ours, um, and we would generate images that we put into a queue uh, with some normal images, and then we would use that to train an ensemble of defenses instead of just a single defense. So this was again a defense which consisted of multiple models with all of the image transformations and resizing and whatnot built into it. Uh, and then also a, uh, a layer at the output that merged those that was also gradient capable and could learn. And then we went those like back and forth. Uh, to make this work, uh, we used the uh, GCP credits that we won earlier in the competition. Uh, we used four P100 instances, which are 16 gigabyte uh, cards in uh, Google Cloud. <coughs> we ran through the full ImageNet as the, the feeding for this training. Um, two of the GPUs were responsible uh, with two processes doing the attacks and queuing those adversarial things into a multi-process queue. And then uh, two more GPUs in a different process were pulling those out and uh, running them through the defense and training the defense in the typical image network. So, this was something that we decided to do pretty late in the game, and uh, we were on the fence as to whether we should go down this path and give it a shot, and we were kind of running out of ideas to try at the end, and we were like, let's, let's go for it. Uh, it burned through like $500 in cloud credits within a couple days, uh, and I also ran into a pretty big problem with Google Cloud. Uh, they go down for maintenance, and they don't migrate you. Uh, CPU instances will migrate, GPU instances do not migrate, I did not know this. This was not in any goal print anywhere, so I didn't have anything hooked up to like monitor that we're going down for maintenance, and I lost a day and a half. The checkpoints were a day and a half. That was basically one epoch. So I lost like $300 worth of cloud credits and had to boot it up with two days left in the competition and restart. And it showed promise. Um, right in the very last upload deadline, I was just waiting for like our local Cloudrunhands framework to run this against our sort of different attacks to gauge whether it was better than our normal um, defense, and it turned out it was, but I didn't get that result until after the final closure, so we'll never know how well this did, but I think it actually would have done pretty decently and bumped us up a little bit on the defense. It was a cool idea. Um, I think we've already covered 
this this is the the quote from a recent paper talking about um, having significantly <coughs> larger capacity than correct uh, having larger capacities requires to co uh, correctly classify adversarial versus uh, benign and normal examples. So the more capacity models have, the better able it's going to be to learn that boundary and be training it in an adversarial fashion. Um, this is easy to see in MNIST, but it's hard to figure out to go through all that stuff to do an ImageNet and typical ImageNet models. Oh, in addition, like because we had the actual ensembling of our model in this situation uh, learnable, I started out, I defaulted the, uh, the weights on the very last layer, just did a diagonal that was scaled by the number of models we had. So it started off with pre trained in a situation where it would protect the right thing, because it was basically just doing a basic average. And then from there, that final layer would start learning uh, additional weighting on the different models based on which one would perform better. And uh, you could also try training like locking the whole thing versus just locking that averager. We didn't have much time to go through the different iterations, but I think it had some promise. And then we, uh, we both used PyTorch in this competition. I actually started off, um, made a little basic uh, baseline attack and defense that mirrored the Google TensorFlow ones. And some people, including the, the Ring team that won all the things, based their stuff off of that, which was kind of cool. Um, so we were the, the PyTorch guys. Uh, this is, I think, the, the best example that shows why PyTorch, at least in my opinion, is so darn cool. Because I can't even think about how I would ever do this in uh, like a static graph TensorFlow like situation. So it's basically there's some code outside of this where we load all of the weights into like our ensemble of models. So maybe self models is five different models or something, and you're loading like 100, 500 megabyte weights files into each of those models. They're on the CPU and system memory. Um, Ten PyTorch is a uh, uh, dynamic graph, uh, unlike TensorFlow where you have to build a graph and then feed things in through a, a session run and like grab the things out in a different environment. It's very flexible PyTorch in terms of being able to flip back and forth between uh, NumPy and your sort of GPU, CPU, tensor line. So basically, this next model is trying to take the next model in its cycle and bring it into GPU memory uh, so that it can do fast computations. And it's ridiculously easy. So you can basically just deep copy all the parameters on the CPU and then you, if you have multiple devices, so say we have our two GPUs, you use their data parallel extra abstraction, which basically copies the weights of two different GPUs and sets up some reduction on the, the gradient outputs uh, at the end so that one GPU <coughs> does the computations. Or you, if you have a single GPU, you just use the, that one. And that, those commands basically move the parameters of the CPU onto the GPU and pass it on to the next stage, which is doing the optimizer and computations, and that's it. Like, You've moved all the parameters of the whole model from CPU land to GPU land, and you can just cycle through. And when you overwrite the old one, all those old like memory in the GPU gets freed up, and you don't have to deal with it pretty much anything. And when I was thinking about this multi-GPU adversarial training thing, I was like, well, this is going to take a while. PyTorch is actually remarkably simple, and yeah, TensorFlow I tend to begin to think how it would accomplish that. It's a little annoying at first having to do these model.kuda calls.